Introduction to Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is a general cry of paradox when scholars, struck by some historical error, attempt to correct it. But for whoever studies modern history to its depths, it is plain that historians are privileged liars, who lend their pen to popular beliefs, precisely as the newspapers of the day, or most of them, express the opinions of their readers. Historical independence has shown itself much less among lay writers than among those of the church. It is from the Benedictines, one of the glories of France, that the purest light has come to us in the matter of history, so long, of course, as the interests of the order are not involved. About the middle of the 18th century, great and learned controversialists struck by the necessity of correcting popular errors endorsed by historians made and published to the world very remarkable works. Thus M. de Lenoy, nicknamed the Expeller of Saints, made cruel war upon the saints surreptitiously smuggled into the church. Thus the emulators of the Benedictines, the members, too little recognised, of the Académie des Inscriptions en Belle Lettre began on many obscure historical points a series of monographs, which are admirable for patience, erudition, and logical consistency. Thus Voltaire, for a mistaken purpose and with ill-judged passion, frequently cast the light of his mind on historical prejudices. Diderot undertook, in this direction, a book, much too long, on the era of imperial Rome. If it had not been for the French Revolution, criticism applied to history might then have prepared the elements of a good and true history of france the proofs of which had long been gathered by the benedictines louis the sixteenth a just mind himself translated the english work in which walpole endeavoured to explain richard the third a work much talked of in the last century why do personages so celebrated as kings and queens so important as the generals of armies become objects of horror or derision Half the world hesitates between the famous song on Marlborough and the history of England. And it also hesitates between history and popular tradition as to Charles the Ninth. At all epochs, when great struggles take place between the masses and authority, the populace creates for itself an Ogre-esque personage. If it is allowable to coin a word to convey a just idea. Thus, to take an example in our own time, if it had not been for the memorial of St. Helena and the controversies between the Royalists and the Bonapartists, there was every probability that the character of Napoleon would have been misunderstood. A few more Abbe de Pardie, a few more newspaper articles, and from being an emperor, Napoleon would have turned into an ogre. How does error propagate itself? The mystery is accomplished under our very eyes without our perceiving it. No one suspects how much solidity the art of printing has given both to the envy which pursues greatness and to the popular ridicule which fastens a contrary sense on a grand historical act. Thus the name of the Prince de Polignac is given throughout the length and breadth of France to all bad horses that require whipping, and who knows how that will affect the opinion of the future as the coup d'etat of the Prince de Polignac himself, in consequence of a whim of shakespeare or perhaps it may have been a revenge like that of beaumarchais on burgas burgas falstaff is in england a type of the ridiculous his very name provokes laughter he is the king of clowns now instead of being enormously pot-bellied absurdly amorous vain drunken old and corrupted falstaff was one of the most distinguished men of his time a knight of the garter holding a high command in the army at the accession of henry v Sir John Falstaff was only thirty-four years old. This general, who distinguished himself at the Battle of Agincourt, and there took prisoner the Duc d'Alençon, captured in 1420 the town of Montereau, which was vigorously defended. Moreover, under Henry the Sixth, he defeated 10,000 French troops with 1,500 weary and famished men. So much for war. Now let us pass to literature and see... Our own Rabelais, a sober man who drank nothing but water, but is held to be, nevertheless, an extravagant lover of good cheer and a resolute drinker. A thousand ridiculous stories are told about the author of one of the finest books in French literature, Pantocrile. 
Atina, a friend of Titian and the Voltaire of his century, has in our day a reputation the exact opposite of his works and of his character, a reputation which he owes to a grossness of wit in keeping with the writings of his age, when broad farce was held in honour and queens and cardinals wrote tales which would be called in these days licentious. One might go on multiplying such instances indefinitely. In France, and that too, during the most serious epoch of modern history, no woman, unless it be Brunerot or Fredegonde, has suffered from popular error so much as Catherine de' Medici, whereas Marie de Medici, all of whose actions were prejudicial to France, has escaped the shame which ought to cover her name. Marie de' Medici wasted the wealth amassed by Henry the Fourth. She never purged herself of the charge of having known of the king's assassination. Her intimate was de Pénon, who did not ward off Ravalec's blow, and who was proved to have known the murderer personally for a long time. Marie's conduct was such that she forced her son to banish her from France, where she was encouraging her other son, Gaston, to rebel, and the victory Rochelieu at last won over her on the day of the dupes was due solely to the discovery the cardinal made, and imparted to Louis Thirteenth of secret documents relating to the death of Henri the Fourth. Catherine de' Medici, on the contrary, saved the crown of France. She maintained the royal authority in the midst of the circumstances under which more than one great prince would have succumbed. Having to make head against factions and ambitions like those of the Guises and the House of Bourbon, and against men such as the two cardinals of Lorraine, the two Balafre and the two Condé, against the queen, Jean d'Albret, Henri IV, the Connetable de Montmorency, Calvin, the three colonies, Theodore de Bez, she needed to possess and to display the rare qualities and precious gifts of a statesman under the mocking fire of the Calvinist press. Those facts are incontestable. Therefore, to whosoever burrows into the history of the sixteenth century in France, the figure of Catherine de Medici will seem like that of a great king. When calumny is once dissipated by facts, recovered with difficulty from among the contradictions of pamphlets and false anecdotes all explains itself to the fame of this extraordinary woman who had none of the weaknesses of her sex who lived chaste amid the license of the most dissolute court in europe and who in spite of her lack of money erected noble public buildings as if to repair the loss caused by the iconoclasms of the calvinists who did as much harm to art as to the body politic hemmed in between the Guises who claimed to be the heirs of Charlemagne and the factious young branch who sought to screen the treachery of the Connetable de Bourbon behind the throne, Catherine forced to combat heresy, which was seeking to annihilate the monarchy, without friends, aware of treachery among the leaders of the Catholic party, foreseeing a republic in the Calvinist party, Catherine employed the most dangerous but the surest weapon of public policy, craft. She resolved to trick and so defeat successfully the Guises who were seeking the ruin of the House of Valois, the Bourbons, who sought the crown, and the reformers, the radicals of those days, who dreamed of an impossible republic, like those of our time, who have, however, nothing to reform. Consequently, so long as she lived, the Valois kept the throne of France. The great historian of that time, de Thieu, knew well the value of this woman when on hearing of her death he exclaimed it is not a woman it is monarchy itself that has died catherine had in the highest degree the sense of royalty and she defended it with admirable courage and persistency the reproaches which calvinist writers have cast upon her are to her glory she incurred them by reason only of her triumphs could she placed as she was triumph otherwise than by craft the whole question lies there as for violence that means is one of the most disputed questions of public policy in our time it has been answered on the place louis the fifteenth where they have now set up an egyptian stone as if to obliterate regicide and offer a symbol of the system of materialistic policy which governs us it was answered at the calme and at the abbe answered on the steps of saint roche answered once more by the people against the king before the Louvre in 1830. 
as it has since been answered by Lafayette's best of all possible republics against the Republican insurrection at Somri and the Rue de Hansnonin. All power, legitimate or illegitimate, must defend itself when attacked. But the strange thing is that where the people are held heroic in their victory over the nobility, power is called murderous in its duel with the people. If it succumbs after its appeal to force, power is then called imbecile. The present government is attempting to save itself by two laws from the same evil Charles X tried to escape by two ordinances. Is it not a bitter derision? Is craft permissible in the hands of power against craft? May it kill those who seek to kill it? The massacres of the revolution have replied to the massacres of saint Bartholomew. The people become king have done against the king and the nobility what the king and the nobility did against the insurgents of the sixteenth century. Therefore the popular historians, who know very well that in a like case the people will do the same thing over again, have no excuse for blaming Catherine de' Medici and Charles the Ninth. All power, said Casimir Perrier, on learning what power ought to be, is a permanent conspiracy. We admire the anti-social maxims put forth by daring writers. Why then this disapproval, which in France attaches to all social truths when boldly proclaimed? This question will explain in itself alone historical errors. Apply the answer to the destructive doctrines which flatter popular passions and the conservative doctrines which repress the mad efforts of the people, and you will find the reason of the unpopularity and also the popularity of certain personages. Lobardemont and Laffemas were, like some men of today, devoted to the defence of power in which they believed. Soldiers or judges, they all obeyed royalty. In these days, Dorte would be dismissed for having misunderstood the orders of the ministry. But Charles X left him governor of a province. The power of the many is accountable to no one. The power of one is compelled to render account to its subjects to the great as well as to the small. Catherine, like Philip II and the Duke of Alba, like the Guises and Cardinal Granve, saw plainly the future that the Reformation was bringing upon Europe. She and they saw monarchies, religion, authority shaken. Catherine wrote from the cabinet of the kings of France a sentence of death to that spirit of inquiry which then began to threaten modern society a sentence which Louis the Fourteenth ended by executing. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes was an unfortunate measure, only so far as it caused the irritation of all Europe against Louis the Fourteenth. At another period, England, Holland, and the Holy Roman Empire would not have welcomed banished Frenchmen and encouraged revolt in France. Why refuse, in these days, to the majestic adversary the most barren of heresies, the grandeur she derived from the struggle itself? Calvinists have written much against the craftiness of Charles the Ninth, but travel through France, see the ruins of noble churches, estimate the fearful wounds given by the religionists to the social body, learn what vengeance they inflicted, and you will ask yourself, as you deplore the evils of individualism, the disease of our present France, the germ of which is in the questions of liberty of conscience then agitated, you will ask yourself, I say, on which side were the executioners? There are, unfortunately, as Catherine herself says in the third division of this study of her career, in all ages hypocritical writers always ready to weep over the fate of two hundred scoundrels killed necessarily. Caesar, who tried to move the Senate to pity the attempt of Catiline, might perhaps have got the better of Cicero, could he have had an opposition and its newspapers at his command. Another consideration explains the historical and popular disfavour in which Catherine is held. The opposition in France has always been Protestant, because it has had no policy but that of negation. It inherits the theories of Lutherans, Calvinists, and Protestants on the terrible words liberty, tolerance, progress, and philosophy. Two centuries have been employed by the opponents of power in establishing the doubtful doctrine of the libre arbitre, liberty of will. Two other centuries were employed in developing the first corollary of liberty of will, namely, liberty of conscience. 
our century is endeavouring to establish the second, namely, political liberty. Placed between the ground already lost and the ground still to be defended, Catherine and the Church proclaimed the salutary principle of modern societies, una fides, unus dominus, using their power of life and death upon the innovators. Though Catherine was vanquished, succeeding centuries have proved her justification. The product of liberty, will, religious liberty, and political liberty, not, observe this, to be confounded with civil liberty, is the France of today. What is the France of 1840? A country occupied exclusively with material interests, without patriotism, without conscience, where power has no vigour, where election, the fruit of liberty of will and political liberty, lifts to the surface none but commonplace men, where brute force is now become a necessity against popular violence, where discussion, spreading into everything, stifles the action of legislative bodies, where money rules all questions, where individualism, the dreadful product of the division of property ad infinitum, will suppress the family and devour all, even the nation, which egoism will some day deliver over to invasion. And will say, why not the Tsar? Just as they said, why not the Duc d'Orléans? We don't cling to many things even now, but fifty years hence we shall cling to nothing. Thus, according to Catherine de' Medici, and according to all those who believe in a well-ordered society, in social man, the subject cannot have liberty of will, or not to teach the dogma of liberty of conscience, or demand political liberty. But as no society can exist without guarantees granted to the subject against the sovereign, there results for the subject liberties subject to restriction. Liberty? No. Liberties? Yes. Precise and well-defined liberties. That is in harmony with the nature of things. It is assuredly beyond the reach of human power to prevent the liberty of thought, and no sovereign can interfere with money. Great statesmen who are vanquished in the long struggle it lasted five centuries, recognized the right of subjects to great liberties. But they did not admit their right to publish antisocial thoughts, nor did they admit the indefinite liberty of the subject. To them the word subject and liberty were terms that contradicted each other, just as the theory of citizens being all equal constitutes an absurdity which nature contradicts at every moment. To recognize the necessity of a religion the necessity of authority, and then relieve people of the right to deny religion, attack its worship, oppose the exercise of power by public expression, communicable and communicated by thought, was an impossibility which the Catholics of the 16th century would not hear of. Alas, the victory of Calvinism will cost France more in the future than it has yet cost her, for religious sects and humanitarian quality-leveling politics are today the tale of Calvinism, and, judging by the mistakes of the present power, its contempt for intellect, its love for material interests, in which it seeks the basis of its support, though material interests are the most treacherous of all supports, we may predict that unless some providence intervenes, the genius of destruction will again carry the day over the genius of preservation. The assailants, who have nothing to lose, and all to gain, understand each other thoroughly, whereas their rich adversaries will not make any sacrifice, either of money or self-love, to draw to themselves supporters. The art of printing came to the aid of the opposition begun by the Vaudois and the Albigenses. As soon as human thought, instead of condensing itself, as it was formerly forced to do to remain in communicable form, took on a multitude of garments and became, as it were, the people itself, Instead of remaining a sort of axiomatic divinity, there were two multitudes to combat. The multitude of ideas and the multitude of men. The royal power succumbed in that warfare, and we are now assisting in France at its last combination with elements which render its existence difficult, not to say impossible. Power is action, and the elective principle is discussion. There is no policy, no statesmanship possible, where discussion is permanent. Therefore, we ought to recognize the grandeur of the women who had the eyes to see this future and fought it bravely. That the House of Bourbon was able to succeed to the House of Valois, that it found a crown preserved to it, was due solely to Catherine de' Medici. Suppose the second Balafre had lived. 
no matter how strong the bernet was it is doubtful whether he could have seized the crown seeing how dearly the duc de mayenne and the remains of the guise party sold it to him the means employed by catherine who certainly had to reproach herself with the deaths of francois the second and charles the ninth whose lives might have been saved in time were never it is observable made the subject of accusations by either the calvinists or modern historians though there was no poisoning as some grave writers have said there was other conduct almost as criminal there is no doubt she hindered pare from saving one and allowed the other to accomplish his own doom by moral assassination the sudden death of francois the second and that of charles the ninth were no injury to the calvinists and therefore the causes of these two events remained in a secret sphere and were never suspected either by the writers of the people of that day they were not divined except by de tu l'hôpital and minds of that caliber or by the leaders of the two parties who were coveting or defending the throne and believed such means necessary to their end popular songs attacked strangely enough catherine's morals everyone knows the anecdote of the soldier who was roasting a goose in the courtyard of the chateau de tour during the conference between catherine and henri the fourth singing as he did so a song in which the queen was grossly insulted henri the fourth drew his sword to go out and kill the man but catherine stopped him and contented herself with calling from the window to her insulter eh but it was catherine who gave you the goose though the executions at amboise were attributed to catherine and though the calvinists made her responsible for all the inevitable evils of that struggle it was with her as it was later with robespierre who was still waiting to be justly judged catherine was moreover rightly punished for a preference for the duc d'anjou to whose interests the two elder brothers were sacrificed henri the third like all spoilt children ended in becoming absolutely indifferent to his mother and he plunged voluntarily into the life of debauchery which made of him what his mother had made of charles the ninth a husband without sons a king without heirs unhappily the duc d'alencon catherine's last male child had already died a natural death the last words of the great queen were like a summing up of her lifelong policy which was moreover so plain in its common sense that all cabinets are seen under similar circumstances to put it in practice enough cut off my son she said when henri the third came to her deathbed to tell her that the great enemy of the crown was dead now peace together by which she meant that the throne should at once reconcile itself with the house of Lorraine and make use of it as the only means of preventing evil results from the hatred of the guises and holding out to them the hope of surrounding the king but the persistent craft and dissimulation of the woman and the italian which she had never failed to employ, was incompatible with the debauched life of her son. Catherine de' Medici once dead, the policy of the Valois died also. Before undertaking to write the history of the manners and morals of this period in action, the author of this study has patiently and minutely examined the principal reigns in the history of France, the quarrel of the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, that of the Guises and the Valois, each of which covers a century. His first intention was to write a picturesque history of France. Three women, Isabella of Bavaria, Catherine and Marie de' Medici, hold an enormous place in it, their sway reaching from the 14th to the 17th century, ending in Louis the Fourteenth. Of these three queens, Catherine is the finer and more interesting. Hers was virile power, dishonoured neither by the terrible amours of Isabella, nor by those even more terrible, though less known, of Marie de' Medici. Isabella summoned the English into France against her son, and loved her brother-in-law, the Duke d'Orléans. The record of Marie de' Medici is heavier still. Neither had political genius. It was in the course of these studies that the writer acquired a conviction of Catherine's greatness. As he became initiated into the constantly renewed difficulties of her position, he saw with what injustice historians, all influenced by Protestants, had treated this queen. Out of this conviction grew the three sketches which here follow, in which some erroneous opinions formed upon Catherine, also upon the persons who surround her and on the events of her time are refuted. If this book is placed among the philosophical studies, it is because it shows the spirit of a time, and because we may clearly see in it the influence of thought. But before entering the political arena, where Catherine will be seen facing the two great difficulties of her career, 
it is necessary to give a succinct account of her preceding life from the point of view of impartial criticism in order to make, take in as much as possible of this vast and regal existence up to the moment when the first part of the present study begins never was there any period in any land in any sovereign family a greater contempt for legitimacy than in the famous house of the medici on the subject of power they held the same doctrine now professed by russia namely to whichever head the crown goes he is the true the legitimate sovereign mirabeau had reason to say there has been but one mesalliance in my family that of the medici for in spite of the paid efforts of genealogists it is certain that the medici before everardo de medici gonfaloniero of florence in thirteen fourteen were simple florentine merchants who became very rich the first personage of, in this family who occupies an important place in the history of the famous tuscan republic is silvestro de medici gonfaloniero in thirteen seventy eight this silvestro had two sons cosmo and lorenzo de medici from cosmo are descended lorenzo the magnificent duke de nemours duke de Bino, father of catherine pope leo x pope clement VII, and alessandro not duke of florence as historians call him but duke della citta di pena a title given by pope clement the seventh as a halfway station for that of grand duke of tuscany from lorenzo are descended the florentine brutus lorenzino who killed alessandro cosmo the first grand duke and all the sovereigns of tuscany till seventeen thirty seven at which period the house became extinct but neither of the two branches the branch cosmo and the branch lorenzo reigned through their direct and legitimate lines until the close of the sixteenth century when the grand dukes of tuscany began to succeed each other peacefully alessandro de medici he to whom the title of duke della citta de pena was given was the son of the duke de Bino. Catherine's father by a Moorish slave. For this reason, Lorenzino claimed a double right to kill Alessandro, as a usurper in his house, as well as an oppressor of the city. Some historians believe that Alessandro was the son of Clement VII. The fact that led to the recognition of this bastard as chief of the Republic and head of the House of the Medici was his marriage with Margaret of Austria, natural daughter of Charles V. Francesco de Medici, husband of Bianca Capello, accepted as his son a child of poor parents brought by the celebrated venetian and strange to say ferdinando on succeeding francesco maintained the substituted child in all his rights that child called antonio de medici was considered during four reigns as belonging to the family he won the affection of everybody rendered important services to the family and died universally regretted nearly all the first medici had natural children whose careers were invariably brilliant for instance, the Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, afterwards Pope under the name of Clement VII, was the illegitimate son of Giuliano I. Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici was also a bastard, and came very near being Pope and the head of the family. Lorenzo II, the father of Catherine, married in 1518 for his second wife, Madeleine de la Tour de Bologna, in Avergne, and died April the 25th, 1519, a few days after his wife, who died in giving birth to Catherine. Catherine was therefore orphaned of father and mother as soon as she drew breath. Hence the strange adventures of her childhood, mixed up as they were with the bloody efforts of the Florentines when seeking to recover their liberty from the Medici. The latter, desirous of continuing to reign in Florence, behaved with such circumspection that Lorenzo, Catherine's father, had taken the name of Duke de Bino. At Lorenzo's death, the head of the house of the Medici was Pope Leo X, who sent the illegitimate son of Giuliano, Giulio de' Medici, then cardinal, to govern Florence. The year the tenth was great uncle to Catherine, and this cardinal Giulio, afterward Clement VII, was her uncle by the left hand. It was during the siege of Florence, undertaken by the Medici to force their return there, that the Republican Party, not content with having shut Catherine, then nine years old, into a convent after robbing her of all her property, actually proposed on the suggestion of one named Battista Che, to expose her between two battlements on the walls to the artillery of the Medici. Bernardo Castiglione went further in a council held to determine how matters should be ended. He was of opinion that, so far from returning her to the Pope, as the latter requested, she ought to be given to the soldiers, for dishonour. This will show how all popular revolutions resemble each other. 
Catherine's subsequent policy, which upheld so firmly the royal power, may well have been instigated in part by such scenes, of which an Italian girl of nine years of age was assuredly not ignorant. The rise of Alessandro de' Medici, to which the bastard Pope Clement VII powerfully contributed, was no doubt chiefly caused by the affection of Charles V for his famous legitimate daughter, Margaret. Thus Pope and Emperor were prompted by the same sentiment. At this epoch, Venice had the commerce of the world. Rome had its moral government. Italy still reigned supreme, through the poets, the generals, the statesmen born to her. At no period of the world's history in any land was there ever seen so remarkable, so abundant a collection of men of genius. There were so many, in fact, that even the lesser princes were superior men. Italy was crammed with talent, enterprise, knowledge, science, poesy, wealth, and gallantry, all the while torn by intestinal warfare and overrun with conquerors struggling for possession of her finest provinces. When men are so strong, they do not fear to admit their weaknesses. Hence, no doubt, this golden age for bastards. We must, moreover, do the legitimate children of the house of the Medici the justice to say that they were ardently devoted to the glory, power, and increase of wealth of that famous family. Thus, as soon as the Duca della Cite de Pena, son of the Moorish woman, was installed as tyrant of Florence, he espoused the interest of Pope Clement Seventh and gave a home to the daughter of Lorenzo the Second, then eleven years of age. When we study the march of events and that of men in this curious sixteenth century, we ought never to forget that public policy had for its element a perpetual craftiness and a dissimulation which destroyed in all characters the straightforward, upright bearing our imaginations demand of eminent personages. In this, above all, is Catherine's absolution. It disposes of the vulgar and foolish accusations of treachery launched against her by the writers of the Reformation. This was the great age of that statesmanship, the code of which was written by Machiavelli as well as by Spinoza, by Hobbes as well as Montesquieu. For the dialogue between Scylla and Eucrates contains Montesquieu's true thought, which his connection with the encyclopedist did not permit him to develop otherwise than as he did. These principles are today the secret law of all cabinets in which plans for the conquest and maintenance of great power are laid. In France we blamed Napoleon when he made use of that Italian genius for craft which was bred in his bone, but in his case it did not always succeed. But Charles V, Catherine, Philip II and Pope Julius would not have acted otherwise than as he did in the affair of Spain. History in the days when Catherine was born, if judged from the point of view of honesty, would seem an impossible tale. Charles V obliged to sustain Catholicism against the attacks of Luther, who threatened the throne in threatening the tiara, allowed the siege of Rome, and held Pope Clement VII in prison. The same Clement, who had no bitterer enemy than Charles V, courted him in order to make Alessandro de' Medici ruler of Florence, and obtained his favourite daughter for that bastard. No sooner was Alessandro established than he, conjointly with Clement VII, endeavoured to injure Charles V by allying himself with Francois I, King of France by means of Catherine de' Medici, who both promised to assist Francois in reconquering Italy. Lorenzino de' Medici made himself the companion of Alessandro's debaucheries for the express purpose of finding an opportunity to kill him. Filippo Strozzi, one of the great minds of that day, held this murder in such respect that he swore that his sons should each marry a daughter of the murderer, and each son religiously fulfilled his father's oath when they might all have made, under Catherine's protection, brilliant marriages, for one was the rival of Doria, the other a marshal of France. Cosmo de' Medici, successor of Alessandro, with whom he had no relationship, avenged the death of that tyrant in the cruelest manner, with a persistency lasting twelve years, during which time his hatred continued keen against the persons who had, as a matter of fact, given him the power. He was eighteen years old and called to the sovereignty, his first act was to declare the rights of Alessandro's legitimate sons, null and void, all the while avenging their father's death. Charles V confirmed this disinheriting of his grandsons and recognized Cosmo instead of the son of Alessandro and his daughter Margaret. Cosmo, placed on the throne by Cardinal Chibo, instantly exiled the latter, and the cardinal revenged himself by accusing Cosmo, who was the first grand duke, of murdering Alessandro's son. Cosmo, as jealous of his power as Charles V was of his, 
abdicated in favour of his son Francesco after causing the death of his other son, Garcia, to avenge the death of Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici, whom Garcia had assassinated. Cosmo I and his son Francesco, who ought to have been devoted, body and soul, to the House of France, the only power on which they might really have relied, made themselves the lackeys of Charles V and Philip II, and were consequently the secret, base and perfidious enemies of Catherine de' Medici, one of the glories of their house. Such were the leading contradictory and illogical traits, the treachery, knavery, and black intrigues of a single house, that of the Medici. From the sketch we may judge of the other princes of Italy and Europe. All the envoys of Cosmos I to the court of France had in their secret instructions an order to poison Strozzi, Catherine's relation, when he arrived. Charles V had already assassinated three of the ambassadors of Francois I. It was early in the month of October, 1533, that the Duca della Citta de Peña started from Florence for Livorno, accompanied by the sole heiress of Lorenzo II, namely Catherine de' Medici. The Duke and the Princess of Florence, for that was the title by which the young girl, then fourteen years of age, was known, left the city surrounded by a large retinue of servants, officers and secretaries, preceded by armed men and followed by an escort of cavalry. The young princess knew nothing as yet of what her fate was to be, except that the Pope was to have an interview at Livorno with the Duke Alessandro, but her uncle, Filippo Strozzi, very soon informed her of the future before her. Filippo Strozzi had married Clarice de' Medici, half-sister on the father's side of Lorenzo de' Medici, Duke of Urbino, father of Catherine. This marriage which was brought about as much to convert one of the firmest supporters of the popular party to the cause of the Medici as to facilitate the recall of that family, then banished from Florence, never shook the stern champion from his course, though he was persecuted by his own party for making it. In spite of all apparent changes in his conduct, for this alliance naturally affected it somewhat, he remained faithful to the popular party and declared himself openly against the Medici as soon as he foresaw their intention to enslave Florence. This great man even refused the offer of a principality made to him by Leo X. At the time of which we are writing, Filippo Strozzi was a victim to the policy of the Medici, so vacillating in its means, so fixed and inflexible in its object. After sharing the misfortunes and the captivity of Clement the Seventh, when the latter, surprised by the corona, took refuge in the castle of Saint Angelo, Strozzi was delivered up by Clement as a hostage and taken to Naples. As the Pope, when he got his liberty, turned savagely on his enemies, Strozzi came very near losing his life, and was forced to pay an enormous sum to be released from a prison where he was closely confined. When he found himself at liberty, he had, with an instinct of kindness natural to an honest man, the simplicity to present himself before Clement the Seventh, who had perhaps congratulated himself on being well rid of him. The Pope had such good cause to blush for his own conduct that he received Strozzi extremely ill. Strozzi thus began early in life his apprenticeship in the misfortunes of an honest man in politics, a man whose conscience cannot lend itself to the capriciousness of events, whose actions are acceptable only to the virtuous, and who is therefore persecuted by the world, by the people for opposing their blind passions, by power for opposing its usurpations. The life of such great citizens is a martyrdom, in which they are sustained only by the voice of their conscience and an heroic sense of social duty, which dictates their course in all things. There were many such men in the Republic of Florence, all as great as Strozzi, and as able as their adversaries, the Medici, though vanquished by the superior craft and wiliness of the latter. What could be more worthy of admiration than the conduct of the chief of the Patsy at the time of the conspiracy of his house, when, his commerce being at that time enormous, he settled all his accounts with Asia, the Levant, and Europe, before beginning that great attempt, so that, if it failed, his correspondence should lose nothing. The history of the establishment of the House of the Medici in the 14th and 15th centuries is a magnificent tale which still remains to be written, though men of genius have already put their hands to it. It is not the history of a republic, nor of a society, nor of any special civilization. It is the history of statesmen, the eternal history of politics, that of usurpers, that of conquerors. As soon as Filippo Strozzi returned to Florence, he re-established the preceding form of government and ousted Ippolito de' Medici, another bastard, 
and very alessandro with whom at the later period of which we are now writing he was travelling to livorno having completed this change of government he became alarmed at the evident inconstancy of the people of florence and fearing the vengeance of clement the seventh went to lyon to superintend a vast house of business he owned there which corresponded with other banking houses of his own in venice rome france and spain here we find a strange thing these men who bore the weight of public affairs and of such a struggle as that with the medici not to speak of contentions with their own party found time and strength to bear the burden of a vast business and all its speculations also of banks and their complications which the multiplicity of coinage and their falsification rendered even more difficult than it is in our day the name banker comes from the banque anglice bench upon which the banker sits and on which he rang the gold and silver pieces to try their quality end of section one section two of catherine de medici by honor de balzac translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction, Part Two. After a time, Philippa found in the death of his wife, whom he adored, a pretext for renewing his relations with the Republican Party, whose secret police becomes the more terrible in all republics because everyone makes himself a spy in the name of a liberty which justifies everything. Filippo returned to Florence at the very moment when that city was compelled to adopt the yoke of Alessandro but he had previously gone to rome and seen pope clement the seventh whose affairs were now so prosperous that his disposition towards strozzi was much changed in the hour of triumph the medici was so much in need of a man like filippo were it only to smooth the return of alessandro that clement urged him to take a seat at the council of the bastard who was about to oppress the city and strozzi consented to accept the diploma of a senator but for the last two years and more he had seen like seneca and burrus the beginnings of tyranny in his Nero. He felt himself, at the moment of which we write, an object of so much distrust on the part of the people, so suspected by the Medici, whom he was constantly resisting, that he was confident of some impending catastrophe. Consequently, as soon as he heard from Alessandro of the negotiation for Catherine's marriage with the son of Francois I, the final arrangements for which were to be made at Livorno, where the negotiators had appointed to meet, he formed the plan of going to France, and attaching himself to the fortunes of his niece, who needed a guardian. Alessandro delighted to rid himself of a man so unaccommodating in the affairs of Florence, furthered a plan which relieved him of one murder at least, and advised Strozzi to put himself at the head of Catherine's household. In order to dazzle the eyes of France, the Medici had selected a brilliant suite for her, whom they styled very unwarrantably the Princess of Florence, and who was, and who also went by the name of the Little Duchess de Bino. The cortege at the head of which rode Alessandro, Catherine, and Strozzi was composed of more than a thousand persons, not including the escort and servants. When the last of it issued from the gates of Florence, the head had passed that first village beyond the city, where they now braid the Tuscan straw hats. It was beginning to be rumoured among the people that Catherine was to marry a son of Francois I. But the rumour did not obtain much belief until the Tuscans beheld with their own eyes this triumphal procession from Florence to Livorno. Catherine herself, judging by all the preparations she beheld, began to suspect that her marriage was in question, and her uncle then revealed to her the fact that the first ambitious project of his house had aborted, and that the hand of the dauphin had been refused to her. Alessandro still hoped that the Duke of Albany would succeed in changing his decision of the King of France, who, willing as he was to buy the support of the Medici in Italy, would only grant them his second son, the Duke d'Orléans. This petty blunder lost Italy to France, and did not prevent Catherine from becoming queen. The Duke of Albany, son of Alexander Stuart, brother of James III, King of Scotland, had married Anne de la Tour de Boulogne, sister of Madeleine de la Tour de Boulogne, Catherine's mother, who was therefore her maternal uncle. It was through her mother that Catherine was so rich and allied to so many great families, for, strangely enough, her rival, Diane de Poitiers, was also her cousin. Jean de Poitiers, father of Diane, was son of Jean de Boulogne, aunt of the Duchess de Bino. Catherine was also a cousin of Mary Stuart, her daughter-in-law. Catherine now learned that her dowry in money was a hundred thousand ducats. The ducat was a gold piece the size of an old French louis, though less thick. The old louis was worth twenty-four francs. The present one is worth twenty. 
The Comte of Auvergne and Lorraine was also made a part of the dowry, and Pope Clement added one hundred thousand ducats of jewels, precious stones, and other wedding gifts to which Alessandro likewise contributed his share. On arriving at Livorno, Catherine, still so young, must have been flattered by the extreme magnificence displayed by Pope Clement, her uncle in Notre Dame, then head of the House of the Medici, in order to outdo the court of France. He had already arrived at Livorno in one of his galleys, which was lined with crimson satin, fringed with gold, and covered with a tent-like awning in cloth of gold. This galley, the decoration of which cost 20,000 ducats, contained several apartments designed for the bride of Henri of France, all of which were furnished with the richest treasures of art the Medici could collect. The rowers, magnificently apparelled, and the crew were under the command of a prior of what the order of the Knights of Rhodes. The household of the Pope were in three other galleys. The galleys of the Duke of Albany, anchored near those of Clement VII, added to the size and dignity of the Fertilla. Duke Alessandro presented the officers of Catherine's household to the Pope, with whom he had a secret conference. In which he would appear, he presented to his holiness Count Sebastiano Montecuccini, who had just left somewhat abruptly the service of Charles V and that of his two generals, Antonio de Leva and Ferdinando de Gonzago, was there between the two bastards, Giulio and Alessandro, the premeditated intention of making the Duke d'Orleans dauphin. What reward was promised to Sebastiano Montecuccioli, who, before entering the service of Charles V, had studied medicine? History is silent on that point. We shall see presently what clouds hang around that fact. The obscurity is so great that quite recently grave and conscientious historians have admitted Montecuccioli's innocence. Catherine then heard officially from the Pope's own lips of the alliance reserved for her. The Duke of Albany had been able to do no more than hold the King of France, and that with difficulty to his promise of giving Catherine the hand of his second son, the Duke of Dolions. The Pope's impatience was so great, and he was so afraid that his plans would be thwarted either by some intrigue of the Emperor, or by the refusal of France, or by the grandees of the kingdom looking with evil eye upon the marriage, that he gave orders to embark at once and sail for Marseille, where he arrived toward the end of October 1533. Notwithstanding its wealth, the house of the Medici was eclipsed on this occasion by the court of France. To show the lengths to which the Medici pushed their magnificence, it is enough to say that the dozen, put into the bride's purse by the Pope, were twelve gold medals of priceless historical value, which were then unique. But Francois I, who loved the display of festivals, distinguished himself on this occasion. The wedding festivals of Henri de Valois and Catherine de Medici lasted thirty-four days. It is useless to repeat the details which have been given in all the histories of Provence and Marseille as to this celebrated interview between the Pope and King of France, which was opened by a jest of the Duke of Albany as the duty of keeping fasts. A jest mentioned by Brian Tom and much enjoyed by the court, which shows the tone of the manners of that day. Many conjectures have been made as to Catherine's barrenness, which lasted ten years. Strange calumnies still rest upon this queen, all of whose actions were fated to be misjudged. It is sufficient to say that the cause was solely in Henri the second. After the difficulty was removed, Catherine had ten children. The delay was, in one respect, fortunate for France. If Henri the second had had children by Diane de Poitiers, the politics of the kingdom would have been dangerously complicated. When the difficulty was removed, the Duchess de Valentinois had reached the period of a woman's second youth. This matter alone will show that the true life of Catherine de' Medici is still to be written, and also, as Napoleon said with profound wisdom, that the history of France should be either in one volume only or one thousand. Here is a contemporaneous and succinct account of the meeting of Clement VII and the King of France. His Holiness the Pope, having been conducted to the palace, which was, as I have said, prepared beyond the port, everyone retired to their own quarters till the morrow, when His Holiness was to make his entry which was made with great sumptuousness and magnificence, he being seated in a chair, carried on the shoulders of two men, and wearing his pontifical robes, but not the tiara. Pacing before him was a white hackney, bearing the sacrament of the altar, said hackney being led by reins of white silk, held by two footmen, finely equipped. Next came all the cardinals in their robes, on pontifical mules, and Madame la Duchesse de Binot, in great magnificence accompanied by a vast number of ladies and gentlemen both french and italian 
The Holy Father, having arrived in the midst of this company at the place appointed for his lodging, every one retired, and all this, being well ordered, took place without disorder or tumult. While the Pope was thus making his entry, the king crossed the water in a frigate and went to the lodging the Pope had just quitted, in order to go the next day and make obeisance to the Holy Father as a most Christian king. The next day, the king being prepared to set forth for the palace, there was the Pope, accompanied by the princes of the blood, such as Monseigneur le Duc de Vendemois, father of the Vidame de Chartres, the Comte de Saint Paul, Monsieur de Montpensier, and La Roche Soyon, the Duc de Nemours, brother of the Duc de Savoy, who died in this sad place, the Duke of Albany, and many others, whether counts, barons, or seigneurs, nearest to the king, was the Seigneur de Montmorency, his grand master. The king, being arrived at the palace, was received by the Pope and all the College of Cardinals assembled in consistory most civilly. This done, each retired to the place ordained for him, the king taking with him several cardinals to feast them, among them Cardinal de' Medici, nephew of the Pope, a very splendid man with a fine retinue. On the morrow, those persons chosen by his holiness and by the king began to assemble to discuss the matters for which the meeting was made. First, the matter of the faith was treated of, and the bills put forth pressing heresy, preventing that things come to greater combustion than they are now. After this was concluded the marriage of the Duc d'Orléans, second son of the king, with Catherine de' Medici, Duchess de Bino, niece of his holiness, under conditions such or like to those as proposed formerly by the Duke of Albany. The said espousals were celebrated with great magnificence, and our holy father himself wedded the pair. The marriage thus consummated, the Holy Father held a consistory at which he created four cardinals and devoted them to the king, to wit, Cardinal of Venue, formerly Bishop of Lyceu, and Grand Almoner, the Cardinal de Boulogne of the family of La Chambre, brother on the mother's side of the Duke of Albany, the Cardinal de Chatillon of the house of Coligny, nephew of the Sire de Montmorency, and the Cardinal de Give. When Strozzi delivered the dowry in presence of the court, he noticed some surprise on part of the French seigneurs. They even said aloud that it was little enough for such a mesalliance. What would they have said in these days? Cardinal Ippolito replied, saying, You must be ill-informed as to the secrets of your king. His holiness has bound himself to give to France three pearls of inestimable value, namely Genoa, Milan, and Naples. The Pope left Sebastiano Montecuculli to present himself to the court of France, to which the Count offered his services, complaining of his treatment by Antonio de Leva and Ferdinando di Gonzago, for which reason his services were accepted. Montecuculli was not made a part of Catherine's household, which was wholly composed of French men and women, for by a law of the monarchy, the execution of which the Pope saw with great satisfaction, Catherine was naturalized by letters patent as a Frenchwoman before the marriage. Montecuculli was appointed in the first instance to the household of the Queen, the sister of Charles V. After a while, he passed into the service of the Dauphin as cupbearer. The new Duchess d'Orléans soon found herself a nullity at the court of Francois I. Her young husband was in love with Diane de Poitiers, who certainly in the matter of birth could rival Catherine, and was far more a great lady than the little Florentine. The daughter of the Medici was also outdone by Queen Eleanor, sister of Charles V, by Madame d'Entamp, whose marriage was with the head of the house of Bross, made her one of the most powerful and best titled women in France. Catherine's aunt, the Duchess of Albany, the Queen of Navarre, Duchess de Guise, the Duchess de Vendôme, Madame la Connetable de Montmorency, and other women of like importance, eclipsed by birth and by their rights, as well as by their power, at the most sumptuous court of France, not excepting that of Louis XIV. The daughter of the Florentine grocers was richer and more illustrious through the house of the Tour de Boulogne than by her own family of Medici. The position of his niece was so bad and difficult that the republican Filippo Strozzi, wholly incapable of guiding her in the midst of such conflicting interests, left her after the first year, being recalled to Italy by the death of Clement VII. Catherine's conduct, when we remember that she was scarcely fifteen years old, was a model of prudence. She attached herself closely to the king, her father-in-law. She left him as little as she could, following him on horseback both in hunting and in war. Her idolatry for Francois I saved the house of the Medici from all suspicion when the dauphin was poisoned. 
Catherine was then, and so was her husband, at the headquarters of the king in Provence, but Charles V had speedily invaded France, and the late scene of the marriage festivities had become the theatre of a cruel war. At the moment when Charles V was put to flight, leaving the bones of his army in Provence, the dauphin was returning to Lyon by the Rhone. He stopped to sleep at Tournon, and by way of pastime practised some violent physical exercises, which were nearly all the education his brother and he, in consequence of their detention as hostages, had ever received. The prince had the imprudence, it being the month of August, and the weather very hot, to ask for a glass of water, which Montecuculi, as his cupbearer, gave to him with ice in it. Dauphin died almost immediately. Francois I adored his son. The Dauphin was, according to all accounts, a charming young man. His father, in despair, gave the utmost publicity to the proceedings against Montecuculi, which he placed in the hands of the most able magistrates of that day. The Count, after heroically enduring the first tortures without confessing anything, finally made admissions by which he implicated Charles V and his two generals, Antonio de Leva and Ferdinando de Gonzaga. No affair was ever more solemnly debated. Here is what the king did in the words of an ocular witness. The king called an assembly at Lyon of all the princes of his blood, all the knights of his order, and all the great personages of the kingdom, also the legal and papal nuncio, cardinals who were at his court, together with the ambassadors of England, Scotland, Portugal, Venice, Ferrara, and others, also all the princes and noble strangers, both Italian and German, who were then residing at his court in great numbers. These all being assembled, the cause to be read to them in presence of each other, from beginning to end, the trial of the unhappy man who poisoned Monseigneur, the late Dauphin, with all the interrogatories, confessions, confrontings, and other ceremonies usual in criminal trials, he, the king, not being willing that the sentence should be executed until all present had given their opinion on this heinous and miserable case. The fidelity, devotion, and cautious skill of the Comte de Montecuculi may seem extraordinary in our time when all the world, even ministers of state tell everything about the least little event with which they have to do. In those days, princes could find devoted servants, or knew how to choose them. Monarchical mores existed because in those days there was faith. Never ask devotion of self-interest, because such interest may change, but expect all from sentiments, religious faith, monarchical faith, patriotic faith. The three beliefs produced such men as the Butthor of Geneva, the Sydneys and Stratfords of England, the murderers of Thomas A. Becket, the Jacques Cour, the Jeanne d'Arc, the Richelieu, Danton, Bonchamp, Dalmont, and also the Clemence, Chabots, and others. The Dauphin was poisoned in the same manner, and possibly by the same drug which afterwards saved Madame under Louis the Fourteenth. Pope Clement VII had been dead two years. Duke Alessandro, plunged in debauchery, seemed to have no interest in the elevation of the Duc d'Orléans. Catherine, then seventeen, and full of admiration for her father-in-law, was with him at the time. Charles V alone appeared to have an interest in his death. But Francois I was negotiating for his son an alliance which would assuredly have aggrandized France. The Count's confession was therefore very skilfully based on the passions and politics of the moment. Charles V was then flying from France leaving his armies buried in Provence with his happiness, his reputation, and his hopes of dominion. It is to be remarked that if torture had forced admissions from an innocent man, Francois I gave Montecuculi full liberty to speak in presence of an imposing assembly, before persons in whose eyes innocence had some chance to triumph. The king, who wanted the truth, sought it in good faith. In spite of her now brilliant future, Catherine's situation at court was not changed by the death of the Dauphin. A baroness gave reason to fear a divorce in case her husband should ascend the throne. The dauphin was under the spell of Diane de Poitiers, who assumed to rival Madame de Tomp, the king's mistress. Catherine redoubled in care and cajolery of her father-in-law, being well aware that her sole support was in him. The first ten years of Catherine's married life were years of ever-renewed grief, caused by the failure, one by one, of her hopes of pregnancy, and the vexations of her rival with Diane. Imagine what must have been the life of a young princess, watched by a jealous mistress who was supported by a powerful party, the Catholic party, and by the two powerful alliances Dan had made in marrying one daughter to Robert de la Marque, Duc de Bouillon, Prince of Sedan, and the other to Claude de Lorraine, Duc d'Aumale. Catherine, 
helpless between the party of Madame de Tomp and the party of the Senechal. Such was Diane's title during the reign of Francois I, which divided the court and politics into factions for these mortal enemies, endeavoured to make herself the friend of both Diane de Poitiers and Madame de Tomp. She, who was destined to become so great a queen, played the part of a servant. Thus she served her apprenticeship in the double-faced policy which was ever the secret motor of her life. Later, the queen was to stand between Catholics and Calvinists, just as the woman had stood for ten years between Madame de Tomp and Madame de Poitiers. She studied the contradictions of French politics. She saw Francois I sustaining Calvin and the Lutherans in order to embarrass Charles V, and then, after secretly and patiently protecting the Reformation in Germany, and tolerating the residence of Calvin at the court of Navarre, he suddenly turned against it with excessive rigour. Catherine beheld on the one hand the court and the women of the court playing with the fire of heresy, and on the other, Diane at the head of the Catholic party with the Guises, solely because the Duchess de Tomp supported Calvin and the Protestants. Such was the political education of this queen, who saw in the cabinet of the King of France the same errors committed as in the house of the Medici. The dauphin opposed his father in everything. He was a bad son. He forgot the cruel but most vital maxim of royalty, namely that thrones need solidarity, and that a son who creates opposition during the lifetime of his father must follow that father's policy when he mounts the throne. Spinoza, who was as great a statesman as he was a philosopher, said, in the case of one king succeeding another by insurrection or crime, the new king desires to secure the safety of his throne and of his own life, he must show such order in avenging the death of his predecessor. But no one shall feel a desire to commit the same crime. But to avenge it worthily, it is not enough to shed the blood of his subjects. He must approve the axioms of the king he replaces, and take the same course in governing. It was the application of this maxim which gave Florence to the Medici. Cosmo I caused to be assassinated at Venice, after eleven years' sway, the Florentine Brutus, and as we have already said, persecuted the Strozzi. It was forgetfulness of this maxim which ruined Louis the Sixteenth. That king was false to every principle of royal government when he re-established the parliaments suppressed by his grandfather. Louis the Fifteenth saw the matter clearly. The parliaments, and notably that of Paris, counted fully half in the troubles which necessitated the convocation of the states general. The fault of Louis the Fifteenth was that in breaking down that barrier which separated the throne from the people, he did not erect a stronger. In other words, that he did not substitute for Parliament a strong constitution of the provinces. There lay the remedy for the evils of the monarchy. Then should have come the voting in taxes, the regulation of them, and a slow approval of the forms that were necessary to the system of monarchy. The first act of Henri II was to give his confidence to the Connetable de Montmorency, whom his father had enjoined him to leave in disgrace. The Connetable de Montmorency was with Diane de Poitiers, to whom he was closely bound, the master of the state. Catherine was therefore less happy and less powerful after she became Queen of France than while she was Dauphiness. From 1543 she had a child every year for ten years and was occupied with maternal cares during the period covered by the last three years of the reign of Francois I and nearly the whole of the reign of Henri II. We may see in this recurring fecundity the influence of a rival who was able thus to rid herself of the legitimate wife, a barbarity of feminine policy which must have been one of Catherine's grievances against Diane. Thus set aside from public life, this superior woman passed her time in observing the self-interests of the court people and of the various parties which were formed about her. All the Italians who had followed her were objects of violent suspicion. After the execution of Montecuculli, the Connetable de Montmorency, Diane, and many of the keenest politicians of the court were filled with suspicion of the Medici, though Francois I always repelled it. Consequently, the Gondi, Strozzi, Ruggieri, Sardini, etc., in short, all those who were called distinctively the Italians were compelled to employ greater resources of mind, shrewd policy, and courage to maintain themselves at court against the weight of disfavour which pressed upon them. During her husband's reign, Catherine's amiability to Diane de Poitiers went to such great lengths that intelligent persons must regard it as proof of that profound dissimulation which men, events, and the conduct of Henri II compelled Catherine de' Medici to employ, but they go too far when they declare that she never claimed her rights as wife and queen. In the first place, the sense of dignity which Catherine possessed in the highest degree forbade her claiming what historians called her rights as a wife. The ten children of the marriage explain Henri's conduct, 
and his wife's maternal occupations left him free to pass his time with Diane de Poitiers. But the king was never lacking in anything that was due to himself, and he gave Catherine an entry into Paris, to be crowned as queen, which was worthy of all such pageants that had ever taken place. The archives of the Parliament and those of the Corps de Comptes show that those two great bodies went to meet her outside of Paris as far as Saint Lazare. Here is an extract from Du Tillet's account of it. A platform had been erected at Saint Lazare, and which was a throne, Du Tillet calls it a chair du Parlement. Catherine took her seat upon it, wearing a surcoat or species of ermine short cloak covered with precious stones, a bodice beneath it with the royal mantle, and on her head a crown enriched with pearls and diamonds, and held in place by the Marshal de la Marque, a lady of honour. Around her stood the princes of the blood, and other princes and seigneurs, richly apparelled, also the Chancellor of France, in a robe of gold damask on a background of crimson red. Before the Queen, on the same platform, were seated in two rows twelve duchesses or countesses, wearing ermine circuits, bodices, robes, and circlets, that is to say, the coronets of duchesses and countesses. These were the Duchesses de Tuville, Montpensier, elder and younger, the Princesses de la Roche Soyonne, the Duchesses de Guise, de Nivenois, de Malais, de Valentinois, Diane de Poitiers, Mademoiselle la Batade Légitimée de France, the title of the king's daughter, Diane, who was Duchess de Castrofanes, and afterwards Duchess de Montpensier d'Amville, Madame la Connetable, and Mademoiselle de Nemours, without mentioning other demoiselles who were not seated. The four presidents of the courts of justice wearing their caps, several other members of the court, and the clerk du Tillet mounted the platform, made reverend bows, and the chief judge, Lisée, kneeling down, harangued the queen. The chancellor then knelt down and answered. The queen made her entry at half-past three o'clock in an open litter, having Madame Marguerite de France sitting opposite to her, and on either side of the litter the cardinals of Amboise, Châtillon, Boulogne, and de Lenincourt in their episcopal robes. She left her litter at the church of Notre Dame, where she was received by the clergy. After offering her prayer, she was conducted by the Rue de la Calandre to the palace, where the royal supper was served in a great hall. She there appeared, seated at the middle of the marble table, beneath a velvet dais strewn with golden fleur-de-lis. We may here put an end to one of those popular beliefs which are repeated in many writers from Sauvile down. Said that Henri the second pushed his neglect of the proprieties so far as to put the initials of his mistress on the buildings which Catherine advised him to continue or to begin with so much magnificence. But the double monogram which can be seen at the Louvre offers a daily denial to those who are so little clear-sighted as to believe in silly nonsense which gratuitously insults our kings and queens. The H or Henri and the two C's of Catherine's packet appear to represent the two D's of Diane. The coincidence may have pleased Henri the second, but it is none the less true that the royal monogram contained officially the initial of the king and that of the queen. This is so true that the monogram can still be seen on the column of the Al Orble, which was built by Catherine alone. It can also be seen in the crypt of Saint Denis, in the tomb which Catherine erected for herself in her lifetime beside that of Henri the second, where her figure is modelled from nature by the sculptor to whom she sat on a solemn occasion when he was starting march twenty fifth fifteen fifty two for his expedition to germany henry the second declared catherine regent during his absence and also in case of his death catherine's most cruel enemy the author of marvellous discourses on catherine the second's behaviour admits that she carried on the government with universal approval and that the king was satisfied with her administration henry received both money and men at the time he wanted them and finally after the fatal day of saint quentin Catherine obtained considerable sums of money from the people of Paris, which she sent to Compiègne, where the king then was. In politics, Catherine made immense efforts to obtain a little influence. She was clever enough to bring the Connetable de Montmorency, all-powerful under Henri the Second, to her interests. We all know the terrible answer that the king made on being harassed by Montmorency in her favour. This answer was the result of an attempt by Catherine to give the king good advice in the few moments she was ever alone with, when she explained the Florentine policy of pitting the grandees of the kingdom one against each other and establishing the royal authority on their ruin. Henri the second, who saw things only through the eyes of Diane and Connetable, was a truly feudal king and the friend of all the great families of his kingdom. After the futile attempt of the Connetable in her favour, which must have been made in the year 1556, Catherine began to cajole 
the Guises for the purpose of detaching them from Diane and opposing them to the Connetable. Unfortunately, Diane and Montmorency were as vehement against the Protestants as the Guises. There was therefore not the same animosity in their struggle as there might have been had the religious question entered it. Moreover, Diane boldly entered the lists against the Queen's project by coquetting with the Guises and giving her daughter to the Duc de Marle. She even went so far that certain authors declared she gave more than mere goodwill to the gallant Cardinal de Lorraine, and the lampooners of the time made the following quatrain on Henri the Second. Sire, if you're weak, and let your will relax, till Diane and Lorraine do govern you. Pound, knead, and mould, remelt and model you. Sire, you are nothing, nothing else than wax. It is impossible to regard as sincere the signs of grief and the ostentation of mourning which Catherine showed on the death of Henri the Second. The fact that the king was attached by an unalterable passion to Diane de Poitiers naturally made Catherine play the part of a neglected wife who adores her husband. But, like all women who act by their head, she persisted in this dissimulation and never ceased to speak tenderly of Henri the Second. In like manner, Diane, as we know, wore mourning all her life for her husband, the Senecal de Pais. Her colours were black and white, and the king was wearing them at the tournament when he was killed. Catherine, no doubt, in imitation of her rival, wore mourning for Henri the Second for the rest of her life. She showed a consummate perfidy toward Diane de Poitiers, to which historians have not given due attention. At the king's death, the Duchess de Valentinois was completely disgraced and shamefully abandoned by the Connetable, a man who was always below his reputation. Diane offered her estate and chateau of Chenonceau to the queen. Catherine then said, in presence of her witnesses, I can never forget that she made the happiness of my dear Henri. I am ashamed to accept her gift. I wish to give her a domain in place of it, and I shall offer her that of chaumont sur loire Accordingly, the deed of exchange was signed at Blois in 1559. Diane, whose sons-in-law were the Duc de Malais and the Duc de Bouillon, then a sovereign prince, kept her wealth and died in 1566, aged 66. She was therefore 19 years older than Henri II. These dates taken from her epitaph, which was copied from her tomb by the historian who concerned himself so much about her at the close of the last century, clear up quite a number of historical difficulties. Some historians have declared she was forty, others that she was sixteen at the time of her father's condemnation in 1523. In point of fact, she was then twenty-four. After reading everything for and against her conduct towards Francois I, we are unable to affirm or to deny anything. This is one of the passages of history that will ever remain obscure. We may see by what happens in our own day how history is falsified at the very moment when events happen. Catherine, who had founded great hopes on the age of her arrival, tried more than once to overthrow her. It was a dumb, underhand, terrible struggle. The day came when Catherine believed herself for a moment on the verge of success. In 1554, Diane, who was ill, begged the king to go to Saint-Germain and leave her for a short time until she recovered. This stately coquette did not choose to be seen in the midst of medical appliances and without the splendours of apparel. Catherine arranged, as a welcome to her husband, a magnificent ballet in which six beautiful young girls were to recite her poem in his honour. She chose for this function Miss Fleming, a relation of her uncle, the Duke of Albany, the handsomest young woman, some say, that was ever seen, white and very fair, also one of her own relations, Clarice Strozzi, magnificent Italian with superb black hair and hands that were of rare beauty. Miss Lewiston, maid of honour to Mary Stuart, Mary Stuart herself, Madame Elizabeth of France, who was afterwards that unfortunate Queen of Spain, and Madame Claude. Elizabeth and Claude were eight and nine years old, Mary Stuart twelve, evidently the Queen intended to bring forward Miss Fleming and Clary Strozzi and present them without rivals to the King. The king fell in love with Miss Fleming, by whom he had a natural son, Henri de Valois, Comte Don Guleme, Grand Prior of France. But the power and influence of Diane were not shaken. Like Madame du Pompadour with Louis the Fifteenth, Duchess de Valentinois forgave all. But what sort of love did this attempt show in Catherine? Was it love to her husband, or love of power? Women may decide. A great deal is said in these days of the license of the press but it's difficult to imagine the lengths to which it went when printing was first invented. We know that Arantino, the Voltaire of his time, made kings and emperors tremble, more especially Charles V, but the world does not know so well the audacity and license of pamphlets. 
The Chateau de Chenonceau, which we have just mentioned, was given to Diane, or rather, not given. She was implored to accept it to make her forget one of the most horrible publications ever levelled against a woman, and which shows the violence of the warfare between herself and Madame d'Etampes. In 1537, when she was 38 years of age, a rhymester of Champagne named Jean Vute published a collection of Latin verses in which were three epigrams upon her. It is to be supposed that the poet was sure of protection in high places, for the pamphlet has a preface in praise of itself, signed by Salmon Macrin, first valet de chambre to the king. Any one passage is quotable from these epigrams, which are entitled In Pictavium Anum Auligum. A painted trap catches no game, says the poet, after telling Diane that she painted her face and bought her teeth and hair. You may buy all that superficially makes a woman, but you can't buy that your lover wants, for he wants life, and you are dead. This collection, printed by Simon du Collinet, is dedicated to a bishop, to François Boyer, the brother of the man who, to save his credit at court and redeem his offence, offered to Diane on the accession of Henri II a Chateau de Chenonceau, built by his father, Thomas Boyer, a councillor of state under four kings, Louis XI, Charles VIII, Louis the twelfth and Francois the first. What were the pamphlets published against Madame de Pompadour and against Marie Antoinette compared to these verses which might have been written by Marshal? Hoot must have made a bad end. The estate and chateau cost I am nothing more than a forgiveness enjoined by the gospel. After all the penalties inflicted on the press, though not decreed by juries, were somewhat more severe than those of today. The queens of France, on becoming widows, were required to remain in the king's chamber forty days without other light than that of wax tapers. He did not leave the room until after the burial of the king. This inviolable custom was a great annoyance to Catherine, who feared cabals, and by chance she found a means to evade it. Thus Cardinal de Lorrain, leaving very early in the morning the house of the Belle Romane, a celebrated courtesan of the period who lived in the rue Colte de Sainte Catherine, was set upon and maltreated by a party of libertines, on which his holiness, being much astonished, says Henri Estienne, gave out that the heretics were preparing ambushes against him. The court at once removed from Paris to Saint-Germain, and the Queen Mother, declaring that she would not abandon the king, her son, went with him. The accession of Francois II, the period at which Catherine confidently believed she could get possession of the regal power, was a moment of cruel disappointment, after the twenty-six years of misery she had lived through at the court of France. The Guises laid hands on power with incredible audacity. The Duc de Guise was placed in command of the army, the connetable was dismissed, the cardinal took charge of the treasury and the clergy. Catherine now began her political career by a drama which, though it did not have the dreadful fame of those of later years, was nevertheless most horrible, and it must undoubtedly have accustomed her to the terrible after-emotions of her life. While appearing to be in harmony with the Guises, she endeavoured to pave the way for her ultimate triumph by seeking support in the house of Bourbon, and the means she took were as follows. Whether it was that, before the death of Henri II, and after fruitlessly attempting violent measures, she wished to awaken jealousy in order to bring the king back to her, or whether, as she approached middle-aged, it seemed to her cruel that she had never known love, certain it is that she showed a strong interest in a seigneur of the royal blood, François de Vendôme, son of Louis de Vendôme, the house from which that of the Bourbon sprang, and Vidame de Chartres, the name under which he is known in history. The secret hatred which Catherine bore to Diane was revealed in many ways, to which historians, preoccupied by political interests, have paid no attention. Catherine's attachment to the Vidame proceeded from the fact that the young man had offered an insult to the favourite. Diane's greatest ambition was the honour of an alliance with the royal family of France. The hand of her second daughter, afterwards Duchesse de Malay, was offered on her behalf to the Vidame de Chartres, who was kept poor by the far-sighted policy of Francois I. In fact, when the Vidame de Chartres and the Prince de Conde first came to court, Francois I gave him what? The office of Chamberlain, with a paltry salary of 1,200 crowns a year, the same that he gave to the simplest gentleman. So Diane de Poitiers offered an immense dowry, a fine office under the crown in the favour of the king, the Vidame refused. After which this Bourbon, already factious, married Jean, daughter of the Baron d'Estissac, by whom he had no children. This act of pride naturally commended him to Catherine, who greeted him after that with marked favour and made a devoted friend of him. Historians have compared the last Duc de Montmorency beheaded at Toulouse to the Vidame de Chartres in the art of pleasing, in attainments, accomplishments, and talent. Henri II showed no jealousy. 
he seemed not even to suppose that a queen of france could fail in her duty or a medici forget the honour done to her by a valois but during this time when the queen was it is said coquetting with the vidame de chartres the king after the birth of her last child had virtually abandoned her this attempt at making him jealous was to no purpose for henri died wearing the colours of diane de poitiers at the time of the king's death catherine was therefore on terms of gallantry with the vidame a situation which was quite in conformity with the manners and morals of a time when love was both so chivalrous and so licentious the noblest actions were as natural as the most blamable although historians as usual have committed the mistake in this case of taking the exception for the rule the four sons of henri the second of course rendered now the position of the bourbons who were all extremely poor and were now crushed down by the contempt which the connetable de montmorency's treachery brought upon them in spite of the fact that the latter had thought best to fly the kingdom the vidame de chartres who was the first prince de conde what richelieu was to mazarin his father in policy his model and above all his master in gallantry concealed the excessive ambition of his house beneath an external appearance of light-hearted gaiety unable during the reign of henri the second to make head against the guises the montmorencies the scottish princes the cardinals and the bouillon he distinguished himself by his graceful bearing his manners his wit which won him the favour of many charming women and the heart of some for whom he cared nothing he was one of those privileged beings whose seductions are irresistible and who owe to love the power of maintaining themselves according to their rank the bourbons would not have resented as did jarnac the slander of la chate Noraille, who were willing enough to accept the lands and castles of their mistresses witness the ponts de conde who accepted the estate of saint valery on madame le marshal de saint andre during the first twenty days of mourning after the death of Henri the second the situation of the vidame suddenly changed as the object of the queen mother's regard and permitted to pay his court to her as court is paid to a queen very secretly he seemed destined to play an important role and catherine did in fact resolve to use him the vidame received letters from her to the prince de conde in which she pointed out to the latter the necessity of an alliance against the guises informed of this intrigue the guises entered the queen's chamber for the purpose of compelling her to issue an order consigning the vidame to the bastille and catherine to save herself was under the hard necessity of obeying them after a captivity of some months the vidame died on the very day he left prison which was shortly before the conspiracy of amboise such was the conclusion of the first and only amour of catherine de medici Protestant historians have said that the Queen caused the Vidame to be poisoned to lay the secret of her gallantries in a tomb. We have now shown what was the apprenticeship of this woman for the exercise of her royal power. End of section two. End of introduction.